All right, so uh, I will uh, continue with, uh, with the subject with Irad. That's fine, Anna. And uh, um, what uh, I will, my lab uh, focus is about the ubiquitization machinery and how it is regulated and how it is regulated in uh, Irad. Um, so um, I have to start. Doesn't work. Can we do it here? All right. So I will start. So uh, wha what we are interested in is understanding how the ubiquity machinery uh, um, is um, functioning in Irad. And um, of course, the ubiquity machinery was discovered uh, here in Israel in the mid 70s by uh, uh, Avram Hershko and Aaron uh, Chekhanover. And together with uh, the late Evin Rose, they discovered the enzymatic steps leading to substrate ubiquitylation and eventually uh, degradation, uh, which lead to degradation by the uh, proteasome. Therefore, the ubiquity uh, named the uh, ADES tag. So um, I will just go quickly uh, uh, through the principles of uh, a protein ubiquitylation because it is required for our talk. So we can divide it into different steps. The first step will be the activation of the ubiquitin molecule by an E1 enzyme. Uh, uh, this, uh, required, uh, uh, require, this reaction requires ATP because there is an adenylate intermediate. Uh, eventually, the ubiquitin uh, uh, binds to the E1 through a thioester bond, then transferred to an E2 enzyme, also on a cysteine residue uh, uh, forming a thioester bond. Uh, at the same time, uh, the E3 ligase can bind the substrate and uh, uh, then he can bind the um, E2 enzyme, the charge E2 enzyme, um, where he can bind it to the E3 for a ring domain, the same ring domain that uh, Tom was talking about. So in this case, the E3 ligase actually uh, function as a scaffold <laughs> that actually link between the substrate and the E2 enzyme. And uh, uh, by itself, it doesn't have any uh, function. But as you will see later, we now we think that the E3 enzyme itself is also an activator of the ubiquitylation uh, machinery. So if this process of uh, ubiquitin transfer repeats itself, uh, eventually uh, you can get uh, polyubiquitylation leading to uh, degradation by the uh, proteasome, since only the polyubiquitin chain is recognized by specific receptors on the uh, proteasome uh, itself. So these are the principles, and what are the substrates? So uh, we have many different substrates. Actually, we believe that any protein within the cell can become one uh, day or another a substrate of the system, but we can talk about proteins that are regulatory proteins, short-lived proteins that are rapidly need to be regulated, su such as cell cycle proteins and a large group of other proteins, which are unfolded or misfolded proteins, among them the ERAD substrate, since it, this is a, a major uh, machinery for protein quality control within the, the cells. So I will focus uh, today on this uh, ERAD uh, pathway and the function of the ERAD. And actually, my first uh, um, encounter with the ubiquitin system uh, involved uh, something totally different, oops, which is uh, a cholesterol metabolism metabolism, when I was still a, a PhD student at Tel Aviv University, since uh, Tom already mentioned the HMG co-reductors. Uh, so uh, we're looking about a cholesterol biosynthesis in what we call the mevalonate pathway. And the, uh, the, the first step which is committed to this pathway, for this cholesterol path uh, pathway, is the formation of uh, mevalonic acid. And the enzyme is HMG co-reductors. And this en enzyme is totally regulated, and actually most of the drugs aiming to reduce cholesterol levels within uh, the body, called generally statins, are actually targeting the activity of uh, this uh, enzyme. So um, again, this HMG co-reductors reside in the ER membrane. It spans the, the, the ER membrane eight uh, uh, times, having the catalytic domain uh, facing the cytosol. So uh, uh, work by uh, the Brown and Goldstone lab uh, uh, showed that actually HMG co-reductors levels are tightly regulated within the cell. So every cell 
in our body have the potential to uh, synthesize cholesterol, even though as we know the liver is the main site that uh, catalyzes uh, uh, cholesterol, uh, responsible for cholesterol biosynthesis. But what they found uh, is that, again, if we look at HMGK reductors in tissue culture cells, if you uh, have uh, the cells in full serum, you see very uh, sm low level of the enzyme. However, if you now remove the, uh, the lipids by floating in, in high speed, then you can see that the level of HMG reductors are uh, elevated. And if you now take this lipid deficient serum and add back the product of the mevalonate pathway, such as mevalonate itself or a mixture of sterols, you can see that, again, it is uh, uh, down-regulated. So uh, uh, the Brown and Goldstein uh, groups actually show, uh, from Dallas, they show that uh, a major um, regulatory step for the, uh, the control, the level of HMG reductors is through a biosynthesis of the enzyme. Uh, they identify the SRBP, which are binding protein that find, uh, uh, actually regulate uh, the biosynthesis of the enzyme. Uh, however, what they also find is that the enzyme itself is also rapidly uh, degraded in the presence of uh, sterols or mevalonic acid. What you see here is a pulse chase experiment when you pulse label the enzyme with uh, S35 methionine, then immunoprecipitate it and uh, look for the levels of the enzyme uh, within time after adding an uh, ampule of cold, non unlabeled uh, methionine. So you can see here that the enzyme is pretty stable with a half-life of about 12 to uh, 13 hours. However, in the presence of sterols or mevalonate, you can see that the half-life uh, shortened much uh, uh, four times. And uh, the question was uh, actually, what is the mechanism of degradation of uh, this enzyme? And after a, a, a long time, a long uh, work in our, in, 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 uh, during my uh, PhD studies, we found actually that the enzyme is ubiquitilated, as was anticipated at least from, from E studies. This is the mammalian HMG reductors. So we, when you, you can immunoprecipitate the, the enzyme and then look for uh, ubiquitilated species that look like a smear, again, uh, because you have a very heterogeneous uh, uh, polyubiquitin uh, chains. And uh, moreover, if you now add a protosome inhibitor, such as MD, MG132, now you can see that the level of this polyvignetic species uh, dramatically increase, but the protein is now cannot be degraded, and it remain ubiquitilated. So um, um, following this, uh, 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 so, and you also can see here, if you re-blot the ubiquitin chain with anti-HMG co-reductors, that actually the chain the ubiquitin adds uh, molecular weight to, to the uh, uh, enzyme itself, which is uh, about the size of 97 kilodalton. So uh, uh, after uh, this work, uh, many of the details of uh, um, the mechanism, mechanistic details of the degradation of HMG core reductors were discovered, mainly by the Brown and Goldson group and, and uh, associated uh, previous postdoc and uh, other groups that work at, uh, at the institute. <coughs> And what I think what is interesting is uh, that they found that the same um, enzyme that we had earlier that are involved in protein quality control are also involved in <laughs> sterile uh, regulation of HMG reductors. So you can see here UBC7, the VCP, and also uh, E3 ligase. Uh, um, in, in East it was HERD1, and this is maybe the closest homologue, uh, GP78. So this actually uh, led us to, um, to the mechanism of, uh, of ERAD, and instead of studying cholesterol uh, regulation, we became interested, uh, I became interested later on, uh, in the mechanism of ERAD, and I think we already uh, appreciated how it's going to work. If we have a protein which is correctly folded, it will be secreted to the site of activity. However, if it's misfolded, it will be retranslocated, and you heard today that HERD1 is probably part of the channel, ubiquitilated and targeted for the proteasome. So this is uh, the erode mechanism that you already heard about uh, uh, today. Uh, I think that uh, we should uh, appreciate the, the fact that there are many uh, uh, different uh, diseases, you know, of, of uh, secretory protein diseases and also the one, the, the viral uh, diseases and also uh, uh, cystic fibrosis and other that are actu actually associated with erode. So this is really 
I th we think it's really important to understand the Vedic mechanism because for many of the, these uh, uh, diseases, actually, we don't really know the mechanism. And knowing the mechanism is part of understanding how we can really affect these uh, pathways. So uh, w what we are interested in is really to understand the, the mechanism, and my lab is focusing on these two steps, the recognition, how uh, proteins, uh, misfolded proteins are recognized by the irid machinery, and, and tomorrow uh, my student uh, Ifat will have a, a, a poster about it, how, what are the degradation signals that are, uh, can be recognized by, by the system. And, but today I will focus about the ubiquitylation step. And uh, um, as mentioned earlier, there are two ERAD, main ERAD complexes uh, in East, discovered by the, the Rappaport group and, uh, group and the, the Weizmann group and named by the e 3 ligases, DOA10 and uh, HERD1. HERD1 important for luminar surveillance and ER surveillance of uh, uh, ER proteins, and DOA10 uh, um, is involved in the recognition of nuclear protein as well as cytosolic and others. So the signal for uh, DOA10 is coming from the cytosol, and the fo focus of my talk will be on the DOA10 pathway. So the, the question that we under, want to understand is how substrates are ubiquitylated by the DO10 pathway, and we already have the paradigm of E1, E2, E3, and you will see, as you will see he, here, there actually there are some uh, um, changes or some in, in this model because we what we suggest that actually the um, E3 enzyme by itself, DO10, can activate also HERD1 can activate ubiquitylation of the substrate. And also, if you can see here in the DOA10, there are two E2 enzymes. So if we have a vectorial a pathway of E1, E2, E3, now we have to deal with two enzymes. And it's a, a big question how they work together. If they work together, what is the meaning of having a two E2 enzymes for a ubiqui subset ubiquitylation? In terms of the, 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 um, the path of reaches that we are taking, I would like to, to, to emphasize the, the importance of keeping a correct balance between the in vitro and in vivo experiments. Uh, it is especially, I think, true for in the second part where my student, uh, Itamar, who did the, the work, he, he worked, uh, he studied the, fu the function of this E2 enzyme in vivo. Uh, uh, he went to a meeting just to figure out that there is another student from Germany who became our collaborator who is doing the same thing exactly, but she was doing in vitro uh, studies and the, we're both were stuck. Because if you have, a, you can do in vivo until a certain point when you need to go into mechanism and we could not do it in our system. And they could not validate it, their, uh, you know, experiments, in vitro experiment in an in vivo system. So this was kind of a fruitful collaboration that really helps us to move um, on. So I will start with, with uh, my, my, the first story, which is uh, talking about the function of the E3 ligas. And I already mentioned that the E3 ligas function as a scaffold, bring together via the ring domain, the E2 enzyme, and the, the substrate. However, several studies, structural studies in the 2012 from certain live using UBCH5 as an E2 enzyme, actually found that the ring domain that interact with the E2 also interact with ubiquitin, also affect the interaction between a uh, ubiquitin and the E2. And this interaction is not the covalent interaction that I showed you earlier uh, in the active site of the E2 enzyme. This is a, a side interaction, which is based on, on specific amino acid in this uh, uh, region. And this uh, interaction is important for the ubiquitylation because this is the donor ubiquitin that bind on the E2 and now the acceptor ubiquitin should, be, uh, uh, should hit an accessible lysine on this E2 enzyme in order to form the polyubiquitin chain. In the case of UBC7, and we'll emphasize <coughs> it later, we're really talking about lysine 48 uh, uh, modification. So, okay. So this was done, uh, uh, this was in vitro studies that were done with UBCH5 and uh, different e ring E3s, and we wonder whether we can apply this, uh, um, um, uh, I, this idea also to the ERAD. So first of all, we, we modeled UBC7 with the DOA10 ring domain, because we don't have the full structure, and the ubiquitin. And uh, you can see here the alpha-2 helix that supposedly uh, interact with the E2 enzyme. 
And uh, first of all, we wanted to see whether we can have an in vitro system to study uh, ubiquity lesion. So what we, we did, we took UBC7 together with Q1. As you heard earlier, it is an activator of the reaction. E1, ATP, and ubiquitin without a substrate, and we're looking for a, 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 a polyubiquitin chain. As you can see here, you can see a ubiquitylation a, of free ubiquitin. So there's no substrate in here. It's only UBC7, and UBC7 apparently used ubiquitin as an acceptor for the reaction uh, to initiate the reaction. You can get a polyubiquitin uh, chain, and all uh, of these uh, um, uh, interaction, all these uh, are through the glycine 48 linkage, meaning that the glycine residue of one ubiquitin interact with lysine 48 of the another of the other one. And this is how the, the change is built. So again, we wonder whether the e, th this was done without a ring domain, without the E3 ligase, and we wonder what uh, will happen if now we have the E3 ligase. So we added the ring domain to the reaction. As, as, as you can see here, now we have an activation of the ubiquitylation reaction. Okay, so indeed the E3 ligase, the OI10 as was suggested, in this model, the E3 ligase itself is an activator of a uh, ubiquitylation. Okay, so uh, what was suggested that this alpha 2 helix of the E2 enzyme is the one that is actually interacting with ubiquitin, allowing a, a, a faci facilitation of this uh, reaction. So uh, in this, if you look carefully, closely, and the interaction uh, of alpha-2 and ubiquitin, there are two amino acids that, uh, that seems to have an interaction. This is ly lysine-118 and leucine-121. And we ask ourselves what will happen if we uh, mutate these uh, amino acids uh, to other residue, uh, conserved residues, for example, to arginine or to alanine. And in both cases, it was enough to mutate these two uh, one of uh, these two amino acids actually to abolish ubiquitination. You, see, you can appreciate that now you have very low level of uh, ubiquitination, meaning that probably we affect this uh, interaction of the ubiquitin itself with the E2 enzyme. Therefore, the efficiency of the ubiquitination reaction was uh, dramatically uh, reduced. So this was done without a, a ring domain. So basically, if you just take the protein, you can see this uh, effect. Uh, we can think about this uh, effect of this slicing uh, at uh, two levels. It might affect the charging of ubiquitin itself in the, in the first step. So maybe the E2 doesn't really bind to the ubiquitin correctly, or it can affect the transfer. And we wonder how you, we can actually separate these two steps of ubiquitylation. So to do to so, we established two uh, in vitro assays together with uh, uh, Dr. Ruven Weiner from uh, Hadassah uh, Medical School. One is to test ubiquitin uh, charge, and the other is uh, ubiquitin transfer. So in order to uh, 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 study ubiquitin charge, you can take ubiquitin, uh, change uh, this lysine 48 with, uh, with the cysteine, uh, uh, which allow you to add um, a fluorophore. At this point, uh, again, this ubiquitin cannot really form chains because now it doesn't have the arginine 48. And you can say, uh, uh, follow, uh, study the formation of thioester bond between the uh, ubiquitin and the UBC7. So we did it. We did it with a wild type UBC7 and the mutant UBC7. And you can appreciate that this thioester bond uh, formed uh, evenly in both reactions, regardless of, uh, regardless of the uh, mutation. Uh, addition of DTT that actually uh, you know, uh, breaks this thioester bond uh, uh, actually abolished the, the ubiquitination. So uh, this tells us that probably it's not the charging step that is important for uh, this uh, reaction, rather the transfer, how you uh, check the transfer. So first of all, you, take, you need to have a substrate which is now you, uh, uh, forming a ubiquitin substrate that form thioester bond with ubiquitin, and we mutate this substrate at lysine 48. Again, we don't want to form chain. We just want to have a single turnover ubiquitylation reaction, just to see if one ubiquitin can bind uh, this uh, uh, donor ubiquitin. So in the next step, the acceptor ubiquitin will uh, hit the thioester bond, and you will form a diubiquitin.
and this is the end of the reaction. When we did it, we found that indeed we can see this uh, dimer in the UPT7, but now we cannot see it having this mutation, suggesting that indeed this is the ubiquitination transfer that is affected by the mutations of the alpha uh, to helix. So, uh, as I mentioned, this was done without the ring domain, and the question is, what's now happened with this mutation when we add the ring domain? So, uh, again, we have DOA10 and HELD1, and we can add the ring domain, and when you can see here, then, when you add the ring domain uh, to the mutant, now there is no effect. Now you cannot see enhanced ubiquitization uh, in the presence of the ring domain. However, we got totally different result with the HERD1 uh, uh, E3 uh, ligase. So you can appreciate that now, even though we have the mutant, the UBC7 mutant, adding the ring domain, restore the ubiquitization uh, function. This suggests for us that there is a difference between the way that, uh, um, sorry, suggests for us that there is a difference between the way the HERD1 and DO10 ring domains affect this E2 enzyme. Uh, can we show it in vivo? So we have a battery of substrates, some DO10 substrates, some HERD1 substrate, mentioned by, uh, by Tom Rappaport uh, earlier. And we wonder whether how the mutation will affect these uh, substrates in vivo. And again, you can see here, when we have a, a HERD1 substrate, we don't see any effect of the mutation. Right? This is the active site mutant of uh, uh, UBC7, which of course, affect the degradation. However, if we now take another uh, DO10 substrate, for example, UBC6, which is the E2 enzyme, but also a substrate, now you can see that the uh, degradation is abolished. So again, you can see clear difference between the way the DO10 uh, ring and the HERD1 uh, 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 E3 ligase affect uh, uh, UBC7 mediated ubiquitylation and degradation of the substrate. And we had a battery of this substrate, we always have the same phenotype. The mutation only affects the DO10 substrate, but uh, uh, not the HERD1 uh, substrate that have been used to this study, suggesting that indeed there is a, 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 a difference. And what we suggest, what is the model that we suggest to, to try to explain it, and we, I, I have to say we don't really have I, I, still the, the, the final proof, is that uh, uh, if UBC7 without, is without a ring, this ubiquitin molecule can actually, uh, is very flexible. You know, it can be in many different forms. So it will be difficult for the, accept, for the um, acceptor ubiquitin to uh, attack the, th the, the, um, the lysine 48, okay? So this is a flexible uh, position. However, now if we have the ring, either the, the DOE10 or the HERD1 ring, now uh, it is, uh, the ubiquitin is now more fixed because of the interaction with the, with the ring domain. And this allows the attack of, of the acceptor ubiquitin to form a polyubiquitin uh, chain. And we think that this uh, interaction, the HERD1 interaction, is much stronger because it doesn't need the, the interaction of the alpha-2 helix with the ubiquitin itself. So if we have a mutation in the alpha-2 helix, now, the uh, DO10 ring, uh, uh, the complex with the DO10 ring, it become flexible again. You don't have a, a efficient ubiquitylation. However, this still remains, suggesting that somehow the ring domain interact differently with uh, uh, the UBC7 and uh, ubiquitin itself. Okay, so what I showed you so far, it uh, uh, is that if you have a, a non-covalent interaction between the alpha-2 helix of UBC7, and donor ubiquitin, it is required for a ubiquitin transfer in the DO10 pathway. But stabilization of donor ubiquitin by HERD1 is independent of the alpha-2 helix. So HERD1 ring domain uh, have some other means to preserve this uh, interaction, uh, non-covalent interaction between ubiquitin and the E2 uh, enzyme. So, uh, 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 so to, to summarize, HERD1 and DO10 activate UBC7 by somehow by distinct mechanism. There is some difference, and the, the difference is really important from, from, from a viewpoint of uh, if you want to start having specific uh, inhibitors for the specific pathway. You know, I, I told you about all the, all the diseases which are ERA associated. Uh, if you want to block only one pathway of ERA, it's, it's good to know to be able to, to control it, and this is why 
one maybe intervention point uh, in this uh, uh, region. Uh, indeed, at least for one e other E2 en enzyme, CDC34, it was found that the uh, inhibitor in this region, this is alpha-2 helix, actually have a specific effect on CDC34. So we believe that if we understand better how these uh, interactions of the ring domains uh, happen, how, how the ring domain UBC7 and ubiquitin interact, we may be able to manipulate the system in a way that we can only block one pathway but and not the other. I just have to, to remind you that there are some uh, you know, drugs in the market that involve the ubiquitin system, specific, uh, uh, for example, for multiple myeloma, but, but in this case, uh, what is being used are inhibitors of the proteasome, which is a less specific component of the system. So we re what we really want to have is a specific uh, inhibitor for a specific pathway, and this is the direction where the, where the field is going. So I, I believe that having a, a better understanding of the, you know, the basic mechanism of the differences between the p different pathways can help us to actually eventually to, to intervene and to affect only one pathway, for example, DO10 or HAD, and, but not the, the other one. So, um, so the other question that we were interested in, and this is specifically for the DO10 pathway, because this is the only pathway that have two E2 enzymes, ERAD pathway, that, uh, uh, or quality control pathway that have two E2 enzymes, is uh, um, how these enzymes work together. And actually, this question is, is pretty old. I mean, the, the, the fact that there are two E2 enzymes that they, they work together was already discovered in, in 1993. So it's been more than 20 years, and there was no answer for the basic question of what are the mechanistic implications of having E2 enzymes. Why do we need e, two E2 enzymes in the same, uh, uh, same uh, E3 ligase uh, complex? And uh, as I mentioned, we collaborated with a German group. It's actually uh, the group of uh, Thomas Sommer from the Mark Delbruck uh, Institute. They were doing the in vitro, we were doing the in vivo, and eventually we, we, we figure out it uh, 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 somehow uh, together. So first of all, the question, do, wh why do we really need to E2 enzyme for degradation? And for that, we have a, a, this uh, kind of artificial substrate that we make. It's a, a two transmembrane domain uh, protein, VMA12, that we put a flag in, in one side and a degron in, a, in the other side. And this protein is, uh, is degraded in a DO10 dependent manner. And this is a cyclohexamide chase experiment. You can see that the protein is rapidly degraded in wild type cells. However, if we <coughs> knock out UBC6, 7, or DO10, now the protein is fully stable. So this is a, in this case at least, you really need both enzymes, right? If you knock out one enzyme, you still have the other. It's not enough. You need both enzymes to work together. And the question is how these enzymes uh, uh, work uh, together. So to address it, we started with ubiquitylation assay. We want to look in vivo how the substrate is ubiquitylated under these uh, uh, conditions. So we took the substrate, we immunoprecipitated again, and blocked with anti-ubiquitin. So what you see here is ubiquitylation uh, in wild-type cells of the substrate. If you knock out UBC7, you still have some ubiquitylation, but you can see an enrichment in, in a band here, which is a monoubiquitylated uh, substrate. However, if you now out knock out UBC6, you don't see any ubiquitylation. You get very similar, similar result to what you get when you have a DOA10 knockout, the E3 ligase. So you can definitely see here that there is a difference between the, the way UBC7 handles the substrate and the way UBC6, because you don't need UBC7 to get this uh, ubiquitylation in this band. But I should remind you that what you see here is ubiquitylation that doesn't lead to degradation. As I showed you just a minute ago, when you have UBC7 knockout, the protein is fully stable. So you have mainly a uh, mono ubiquitylation. And uh, uh, what we uh, suggested that uh, UBC6 can add monoubiquitin molecule on the substrate independent of the function of UBC7. So this was done in vitro. We have you know, some idea how the uh, machinery might work, but we didn't really have a mechanistic uh, proof. And for this, we have the, the, our collaborator, the, the, the German group. And what they did, they actually uh, uh, did a similar assay. They did in vitro. They, they have a, a, a recombinant components of the system, UBC, uh, UBC6, UBC7, 
Uh, as a substart, they use uh, the ring domain of DOA10, as you heard earlier. Uh, the ring domain uh, of HERD1 is ubiquity related, and th there is a function for it. The ring domain of DOA10 is also ubiquity related. Actually, the majority of the ring domain will be ubiquity related in in vitro assays. So you can see that in the, when you take the DOA10 ring domain and you add UBC7, you don't see any uh, ubiquity related. If you now add the uh, UBC6, and uh, you don't need the transmembrane domain for this uh, in vitro assay, you can see that you get monoubiquitylation of uh, DOA10. But only when you mix both UBC6 and UBC7, now you start to uh, see a polyubiquitin uh, chain. So this suggests that actually uh, um, um, polyubiquitylation of, uh, by UBC7 actually required first monoubiquitylation by UBC6. By UBC6. And just to prove that there is an order to this uh, step, this thing that we could not do uh, uh, in vivo, it actually uh, uh, what uh, uh, our collaborator did, they actually uh, did a ubiquitylation reaction with UBC6 first, then removed UBC6 and add UBC7 and ask whether can see they see polyubiquitylation. And they used two variants of ubiquitin here uh, with uh, uh, arginine 48 and arginine 63. Presumably arginine 48 cannot form the polyubiquitin change, but arginine 63 uh, uh, do, can. And indeed, that is what they got. They get monoubiquitylation first, regardless if you have arginine ubiquitin R48 uh, or R63. But now when uh, they remove UBC6 and add UBC7, they can see only polyubiquitin, polyubiquitin chains in the reactions containing the arginine 63. So this is actually a proof for the uh, two-step mechanism for substrate ubiquitylation, right? So this is kind of different from what you heard in, in the beginning about the, the vectorial uh, function of the ubiquitin uh, system. And we also uh, must, uh, so we have now a ring domain that uh, have a polyubiquitin on it and we checked it in a mass uh, spectrometry and uh, uh, found that uh, indeed uh, you can have a uh, lysine uh, 48 binds to the ring domain only in the reaction containing UBC7, suggesting that indeed this is only uh, lysine 48 that is formed during the, the reaction. So now we had a problem. We have a very nice in vitro system showing how that you have a sequential mechanism. And we have some evidence in vivo that we can see differences in ubiquitylation. And this was actually, uh, I think, our major uh, concern or, or, or big question. How can we really verify the sequential mechanism in living cells? Because we want to see whether this is, has some f physiological relevance, all these findings. And uh, I, I have to say, we, it took us a while, and we have to do some uh, uh, brainstorming together until we came with an idea. And we actually, they came from, from, from Berlin to, 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 to Israel, and we said, and we thought, and we thought, many ideas. But one idea came, and this is actually came from a paper in 2003 uh, by the Dikic and the Paolo Di Fiori uh, group. And what this group did, they were studying the EGF, EGF receptor internalization, which is also ubiquity independent. But it's, it doesn't lead to degradation by the proteasome. Uh, uh, you can see here the EGF receptor usually uh, reside on the, on, the, on the plasma membrane. However, if you add EGF, now it is uh, internalized uh, in, in, into verticals. And this internalization uh, requires uh, phosphorylation of the receptor, self phosphorylation through the tyrosine kinase domain. And uh, 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 this recruit E3 ligers, in this case it's called Siebel, and, and ubiquitylation of the receptor. So what they did, they removed this uh, region, the TK do domain, and now they uh, fuse ubiquitin to it. And what they found, that it's enough to fuse ubiquitin now to this truncated EGF receptor to get again uh, internalization, as shown in here. So we thought maybe we can use this system in a, in a similar way. Maybe we can add ubiquitin to a substrate and just, just uh, see whether it's enough to uh, t uh, trigger a uh, degradation of uh, independent of UBC6. So as a substrate, we actually decided to, to use, uh, at least in the beginning, we use UBC6 itself. So UBC6 is a substrate of the DO10 pathway, the E2 enzyme itself, and it requires its own activity. So if you mutate the active site cysteine to a serine in UBC6, now UBC6 is not degraded anymore. It's pretty stable. 
so uh, uh, you can see here in, in, in vitro assay that UBC6 itself is also monoubiquitinated. So the activity of UBC6 itself is probably to monoubiquitinate itself, triggering a UBC7 a mediator a, a polyubiquitination and degradation of the substrate. Okay, so what we did now, instead of having this ubiquitin here, now we decided to fuse it. And we can fuse it and uh, prevent the cleavage of this ubiquitin by having a valine 76 instead of glycine, which is the C-terminal uh, region of the protein. And now we take this protein and check whether it's still degraded. And what we found is actually the, the protein is degraded pretty fast. Please pay attention that the time uh, scale here is in hours, one, two hours. Here we're talking about five to 15 minutes. The protein is rapidly degraded. This is the wild type uh, UBC6. And even if you don't have UBC6, you can even see a faster degradation. Maybe there is some competition between the wild type and the mutant UBC6 within the cell, okay? And now if we uh, delete UBC7 in this reaction, or, or DOA10, now the protein is stable again. So suggesting that actually for this substrate, you don't really need UBC6 anymore. It's, you, know, you don't need the activity of UBC6. It's enough to have UBC7 in the reaction, and UBC7 will form, we thought, UBC7 will form polyubiquitin on this ubiquitin. So how can we check it? We can now mutate this ubiquitin with lysine, replacing lysine 48 with an arginine uh, residue. And this is what we did. So now we have a mutant, arg, it cannot form polyubiquitin chains. And now you can see that again, the protein is stable, suggesting that actually UBC7 built polyubiquitin chain on pre-assembled or pre-existing uh, ubiquitin on their uh, substrates. Suggesting that uh, indeed uh, there is a sequential uh, ubiquitination mechanism also in vivo in living cells. First DO10 will add one substrate and then UBC7 will extend the, the chain. And we, we use also another substrate, SBH2. SBH2 is a, is a, is a substrate of the DO10 pathway. It's part of the, uh, another channel that Tom didn't mention today. And if you knock out the uh, UBC6, UBC7, or DO10, you can see stabilization of uh, SBH2 in a pulse chase uh, experiment. And again, if now if you fuse, so this is the stabilization, it's pretty uh, stable in, under these kinetics. Now, if you fuse ubiquitin to SBH2, now it is rapidly degraded. So, this is that it is not only for UBC6, but maybe a general mechanism uh, uh, for uh, polyubiquitination uh, of uh, proteins in the DO10 pathway. Uh, I, I have, in the DO10, I have to say, in the HAD1 pathway, only UBC7 is apparently sufficient to trigger degradation. So, it might be a different mechanism. We have to remember that they also function a different region of the ER. I mean, had one function uh, in the uh, substrate in the lumen of the ER that have to be unfolded first and go through the channel to be become ubiquitinated, and the O10 can recognize substrate in more folded uh, uh, situation and ubiquitinate them at the cytosolic uh, part already. Uh, one last thing that I, I would like to, to mention, I have still have five minutes, yeah is uh, I already told you that UBC6 itself is monoubiquitinated, and we wonder where is the ubiquitination on UBC6 itself. And again, we use a mass spec uh, analysis and looking for a gly, gly uh, 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 of, you know, of the end of uh, amino acid 75, 76 of ubiquitin fused to uh, peptides on UBC6. And one site that we find is actually serine residue, not a lysine residue. So usually, as you know, uh, uh, most of the uh, modification are done on lysine residue, but we found that specifically serine 196 is ubiquitinated. It's probably not this, the only or the single site for ubiquitination because this is done in, in vivo, in, in living cell. If you uh, mutate and replace this uh, serine with alanine, you can see re a strong reduction of monoubiquitination but it's not abolished totally. So there are probably also other lysines or other serine trionine residues that can be uh, ubiquitinated. So apparently UBC6 can add ubiquitin not only to lysine residues, but also to serine. And we think also might be uh, also a threonine, both form a, 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 um, a, an ester bond with, with ubiquitin. And um, we, we ask again with SBH2, what's happened now 
if we uh, remove the lysine, the, the surface lysine in the cytosolic parts of uh, SBH2, these four lysines, and uh, apparently if you remove these lysines, you actually uh, get stronger uh, a requirement for UBC6. You can see you, this is the effect of uh, uh, UBC6 deletion. However, if you have this, what we call SBH2 uh, delta 4K, now UBC6 is, uh, have much, have, is more important because you can see much stronger stabilization in the absence of UBC6. Also, you can see it when you look at the ubiquitylation. If you have the mutant now, you can see that you uh, uh, strongly uh, uh, required uh, UBC6, whereas in, with SBH2, apparently, maybe you don't need it so much. Maybe UBC7 itself can do the work. So we have to think about different scenarios when one, other, one of these enzymes can uh, do the work. And uh, if you now look at the ubiquitylation in the presence of NaOH, which will break the ester bond, but not the, uh, the peptide bond with ubiquitin, and uh, you can see here that there is, when you take the wild type SBH2, there is no difference. However, if you now look at the mutant, there is much str uh, stronger dependence on serine or threonine modification, which is affected by the treatment uh, of NaOH. So I would like to, 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 to summarize this part. So what I, I showed you here is actually the, the, the DO10 pathway required two E2 enzymes for uh, uh, degradation. It is, this is true for certain subsets. There might be other subsets that are in a certain different folding state, which will require maybe UBC7 might be uh, sufficient for, for them. So UBC6 first attach monoubiquitin on a, on a subset. You can do it on a lysine or a hydroxylated amino acid, serine or treonine as well. This, what we think, actually increase the, the repertoire of the enzymes. It's not always that a, a misfolded substance we have a nearby lysine ready to be ubiquitilated. So there are other options, like having a serine or training uh, uh, as well. And then only once uh, UBC6 add ubiquitin on a substance, then um, UBC7 can uh, elongate the chain to form polyubiquitin. Uh, which is uh, degraded then by the proteasome. So, uh, what I showed you today are there some new insights about the, the mechanism of substrate ubiquitylation. There is a paradigm, and probably the majority of the ubiquitylation machinery work, you know, in a vectorial way. But at least for the for the ubiquitin system, for the IRAD system, and specifically, uh, 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 so first of all, we found that there is different activation mode by the different E3 ligases, it's not really uh, equal, it's not the same mechanism. And then we found that for the DO10 part, of it, there is a um, sequential polyubiquitylation, that, and each enzyme in this reaction have a specific uh, role, adding one ubiquitin and then forming the polyubiquitin chain. So uh, with that, I think I will conclude to, to acknowledge the, the people that did the work, and first of all, uh, Itamar Cohen. Itamar was an undergrad in my lab, uh, started as undergrad eight, nine years ago. He have now received his PhD, so he did the master PhD. Unfortunately, we lost him. He started a uh, medical school uh, a month ago, so new career for him. Uh, but I think we'll still see him in, in science uh, sometime later on. And, uh, but he could do, not do the work with, with the help of others. I want to quote uh, what the wise when Men once uh, said, if I've seen further, is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, in this case, these are all the people that did the work that actually paved the way for having understanding the substrate that we were using and uh, having understanding, you know, the basic era that actually led to, to this work. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge the collaborators. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Ruben Weiner from the um, Department of Biochemistry, who really instrumental for, for the in vitro assay that we did in the first part of my talk. And then the Thomas Sommer group and uh, specifically uh, Annika Weber, which I think also received her doctorate recently or will receive it recently. Uh, and these two uh, PhD students, you know, really did all the work that I, you know, described in the second part of, of my talk. And I will uh, finish by thank you for your attention. I am 
looking forward for questions.